Um, I want to thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, on this show this evening, before we get into it, uh, what we're going to do, uh, myself and, and my two guests, Dave Dearson and Brandon Nelson, we're going to describe a uh, short story, not a long story like I'm making it right now, how we came to be uh, in the liberty movement and, and why it's so important to us. And I um, came to it early, probably in my teens, uh, somewhere between the Peloponnesian War and the Great War. Um, I uh, read uh, Ayn Rand uh, and, uh, and uh, associated with the rabble called the Objectivists. And, and despite that, I, I uh, thought that I had a duty to this wonderful nation, which uh, one of our, our donors at Pacific Legal Foundation, I think, beautifully uh, said it when she said, this great nation of ours was made of whole cloth on four large sheets of paper. And I thought uh, that country deserved defending. So I, I joined the military and swore an oath that um, I would protect and defend that constitution in the United States. And as I was in business, um, you know, I could deal quite quite uh, easily with my competition and uh, avoid the pitfalls of the vagaries of the economy. Um, but one thing that, that uh, made me madder and madder every year, and I didn't want to go to my grave a bitter old man, was the crushing boot of the regulatory state, um, which costs us trillions and, and uh, probably scars our soul every night before we go to sleep. So I now work at Pacific Legal Foundation uh, raising money so our pit bull lawyers can grab the government attorneys by the neck and shake them until they give back said constitution. And that's why I'm here. And um, Brandon Nelson, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to be part of the liberty movement um, and, uh, and, uh, and somewhere in there answer the unasked question that I'm going to ask you right now. How did an anarchist run for office? <laughs> Um, well, we'll get started with the easier question. Yeah. Um, I got started with my indoctrination towards liberty um, at a very young age. My mother homeschools, well, homeschooled all five of us, mm -hmm. myself being the eldest. So I was drilled into um, the works by the Founding Fathers, even Frederick Bastiat at a very young age, and that stuck with me. I originally registered as an independent because I was just too fed up with both the Democrats and the Republicans to be able to find a home there. Mm. Um, but the thing that really made me change my stances on a few controversial topics and pushed me towards finally jumping onto the LP was reading the book Ain't Nobody's Business If You Do by Peter McWilliams, mm. which we've discussed a little bit. And that got me to reconsider my positions, the, the holdouts, um, on everything from prostitution to drug legalization to things as mundane as seatbelt mandates. And mm. after reading that book, I, I couldn't remain comfortable as an independent sitting on his hands waiting for the lesser of two evils to reveal themselves in the election. Or two greater of two evils. Rather than, I don't think either one of them is lesser, actually. But go ahead. I yeah. didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. No, no, no worries. Um, but essentially, at, at that point, I, I just... I, couldn't keep it to myself anymore. I had to get out and do something about it. And hmm. that leads us to the second question. And um, I do believe that we should strive for a stateless society and that we should try to find ways of living without the need of an, of an overburden or an, of an overburdensome regulatory state. That hmm. should always be the goal is to push for a complete lack thereof. But I don't unfortunately I think that we can get there without actually putting the work in to change that. Mm -hmm. So that's what got this anarchist to run for office. You have to do it in the stages unless you want to do it with a bomb. And that's, uh, and a, that's a violation of the things. NAP as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there is no armed branch of the Libertarian Party. Nope. Yeah. All right. And Mr. Dearson, Dave? Sure. Um, I, uh, I got into the uh, Liberty Movement in high school. Um, I was one of uh, many uh, thousands of uh, Ron Paul kids across the country. Uh, Ron Paul's 2008 presidential campaign. Uh, before that, you know, I had been, a, you know, your average teenager, um, not feeling especially um, loyal uh, or attracted to either of the two major political parties. And uh, Ron Paul came along and I watched the debates and everything he was saying just sounded uh, different and a little bit crazy. Uh, but also it made a lot of sense. So I looked into it and uh, I really latched on and got hooked. 
Um, I founded my, uh, my high school libertarians club in high school, and I went on to lead uh, the college libertarians group at the uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, and uh, after school, I worked at Students for Liberty, uh, coordinating with uh, their campus programs. And after that, I worked uh, at FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. They do um, First Amendment and other individual rights issues on campuses. Again, a fantastic organization, ladies and gentlemen, of our, the thousands of viewers out there. Um, if you're not familiar with FIRE, um, check it out. Yeah. yeah. FIRE was, uh, it was fantastic, fabulous organization, great people, great message, great mission. Uh, and it was a great place to work. And it convinced me as I was working on their, um, their impact litigation campaign called the Stand Up for Speech campaign. Um, I was really taken with the strategy uh, of impact litigation to, um, to bring liberty uh, you know, back to the country. So I went to law school at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. I graduated just this past May, and I took the bar exam in July, and I'm anxiously awaiting those results, which should come out mid-November. So, uh, so hold on. July to August, September, October, November. So you, you took it on parchment with a quill pen? Yeah, that's right. And the, the scribes are having to... Uh, look well, I think the line. pigeon got lost on no? the way to delivering right, it. All right, right. Well, back to your story, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, so I'm, I'm awaiting my bar results, and hopefully uh, you know, I can be a, a real bona fide attorney soon. But uh, for now, I am a legal fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thrilled to have started at uh, the Pacific Legal Foundation, um, doing the very type of uh, impact litigation that I went to law school to do. Hmm. Is that, uh, if, I, if I understand correctly, at Pacific Legal Foundation, you don't sharpen pencils when you get there. They put you to work. That's right. So uh, let's, let's start with the show, ladies and gentlemen. Enough of this uh, slapping ourselves on the back and congratulating each other on how wonderful we are. Let's start with a general discussion. And what I'd like to ask you to think about is a specific example of the erosion of individual liberty that, that you've either experienced personally or seen that's kind of really just stuck in your craw. And, and, and uh, Brandon or, or David, whichever one wants to jump in first with that. It could be something you read. It could be you know, a case. It could be an uh, example from a book. It could be a friend whose uh, assets have been taken for no reason. Anybody want to jump in or should I start or what? Well, uh, you know, as long as we're already talking about uh, fire, it seems mm -hmm. to me that uh, on, on public college campuses, which ought to be, uh, you know, rightfully should be uh, the place where uh, you're the, one of the places where you're the most free in the society, mm -hmm. the most free to, uh, you know, to try out new ideas and, and try to approach the truth. Uh, it seems that uh, people's ideas are being stifled. Uh, people are treated like children at a time when they should be learning how to be adults. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would think on college campuses you absolutely see uh, an erosion of, uh, you know, of the, uh, free, freedom of speech, of uh, dignity of conscience, being able to, to believe what you want to believe without the school coming in and telling you uh, the, right, the right way to do things, the right way to, to believe in your heart. Um, so I, I think that's uh, definitely a massive issue uh, in terms of erosion of personal liberties. Okay. Brandon, do you have a, a, a specific example or some thoughts on it, or should I jump in with mine? Well, I would say that reading Peter McWilliams' book offered a lot of different examples on how to get angry at government over different subjects, whether, mm -hmm. again, it's prostitution or drug legalization or our enormous amount of nonviolent felons that are rotting in prison cells when they mm -hmm. haven't actually hurt someone. Mm -hmm. um, as far as specific examples, um, none that necessarily was the catalyst for my getting involved. Mm -hmm. um, although a recent example was, I was at a, I was at a town, or sorry, not a town hall, a city council meeting mm -hmm. in my hometown of Dixon, California, and they were talking about a personal cultivation ordinance, which was limiting what you could or could not grow well, on for your... For a minute, I thought that they were going to limit you to Brahms and you couldn't go on to Bach, uh, but uh, go ahead. And, uh, well, no, the, but the personal cultivation ordinance and not all of the city councilmen seem to appreciate the idea of private property being private and property. Mm. Um, or either or, much less yeah, both together. Exactly. Yeah. But they were 
they were trying to severely limit the capabilities of people growing, whether it's medicinal or recreational mm -hmm. cannabis on their own property. And that, that struck a chord with me. And I believe it was Murdoch v. Pennsylvania. You know, you might not be better on the precedent than me. Um, one of, well, in the, in the opinion of the court, it said that if anyone was to, or sorry, if the government was at any point in time um, to try and license a right, which in my opinion, especially as an anarchist in the Mises and Rothbardian fashion, the dispensing and how you use your private property is certainly a right, not a privilege. Mm -hmm. If someone is to license a right and essentially try to make it a privilege through licensure, which mm -hmm. the personal cultivation ordinance would have made, then the individual has the right to operate in that right with impunity regardless of what statute might be. So okay. that was that was something that I shared and not okay. too many of them yeah. were happy, but that was that was a specific example that kind of got me in the moment. Okay. So I, this uh, cultivation ordinance, mm -hmm. this is about you know what you can put in your in your garden at home. What you can put in your garden, whether you can grow it in your back or your front yard, what kind of fencing or security you might need to put in that way, you know, think of the children, comes to mind. Think um, of the children, ladies oh, and gentlemen. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, they don't even know how to roll. Pit. Never mind. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, uh, that's God what forbid I saw they on eat TV. it and get more nutrition and amino acids, right? Yeah, yeah some but essential oils. Yes, yeah. essentially it was... It was trying to shove regulation down people's throats on what they could or could not grow in their own garden. Hmm. So uh, have they I have they taken this a step further? Uh, cantaloupes, tomatoes. To uh, my knowledge, snap peas, no. Um, uh, dandelions, roses, just just uh, one particular herb, as my English wife would put it, because it's got an H in it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So my you you talked about my example. And this isn't a person example, uh, thank goodness, and, and, and more through luck than planning. But we have um, uh, 2.3 million people in prisons and jails in this country. Mm -hmm. And um, if somebody's a felon in this country and they want to make their way in life after getting out of prison for doing something as, as harmless as uh, growing a little pot a few years ago, um, heaven forbid you know, selling some pot to somebody who handed you their, their little wad of money in their own hand. You didn't force it on them. They wanted to buy it from you just like they'd want to buy you mean you a, know, free a cheeseburger. Market. Free market, yeah. Um, strange concept, folks. <laughs> free market. Um, I hope I live to see so the So they, uh, you, you can't. And, and what's really silly is that, that in a lot of these prisons, they have programs to teach people trades. And um, if, if you get out with one of these trades, let's say, you know, metal work or sheet metal work or, or um, say you're a machinist, and then you, you go to work for somebody else, you're just fine as long as all you want is a job. But if you ever want to be uh, an entrepreneur and license yourself as a contractor, you can't do it because you're a felon. And, uh, you know, talking about keeping the people down and uh, uh, oppressing people, uh, preventing them from uh, being able to earn a living after they serve their time for a crime that shouldn't be a crime really sticks in my craw. So then you you talked about free speech on campus. Let's yeah. let's let's go a little bit further into it. I understand in many campuses right now uh, there are free speech zones. My reading of the Constitution tells me that the entire world is a free speech zone. So why do they have to establish uh, an end? Does that mean you your speech is even more free in this specific zone? Or, or tell me about that. Uh, no, unfortunately not. So I, I guess a lot of college administrators uh, think that um, you know maybe they've heard the phrase public forum before, and they think, oh well, you know we're a public university, and free speech and protest is important, um, but we're going to kind of coordinate it off and limit it to uh, this one area of campus. Um, I remember uh, at, the, at the University of Hawaii, actually Fire uh, brought, brought a case about their free speech zone. Uh, it was a small uh, valley uh, in a very, uh, and during the rainy season, it was really more of a free speech puddle than a mm -hmm. free speech zone. 
Um, and they tell you, okay, if you want to protest, that's just fine. Go here where nobody can see you and none of the people who you know donate to our university can see you. Um, but uh, you know they're allowed to place reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions uh, on speech. And so, for example, they, they could prevent you from bursting into an ongoing class and session um, to protest whatever issue it is. Uh, but these free speech zones we see on uh, public university campuses across the country, and remember, public universities um, are arms of the state, they're the government. Um, they're, they're placing very unreasonable time, place, and manner restrictions on, on speech. Mm. Okay. And, um, yeah, I think I remember that fire case. Sounds like I might work for fire, but I don't. Pacific Legal Foundation's where I work. It's also, there are, there are many great organizations, the Liberty Movement, and uh, fire is especially uh, effective at um, you know litigating in in the area of public education. I wish uh, um, they were even more successful, actually. So we'll talk about um, uh, erosion of, of individual liberty since we have Mr. Dearson here, and he's familiar uh, with uh, some of the cases that Pacific Legal Foundation has. Let's let's talk about our dancing boy cases. There there are more than one. Yeah. And and we're not going to. I mean, let's not go you know, law school on them. Here, let's talk about the justice rather than the, the, you know, the specifics of the law, if that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, there are more than one. I think, uh, I think we're up to three now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, basically, uh, in a couple of different spots across the country, in Minnesota and uh, South Dakota, um, there are uh, these really amazing, astounding uh, boys, young men, mm -hmm. uh, teenagers, um, who are spectacular at uh, performative and competitive dance. And uh, they've been doing it uh, their whole lives. It's just something that they love to do. And of course, um, you know, I think maybe, you know, 40 years ago that might have seemed weird to people. Um, I don't know, but Fred. See, th this is where what's weird about dance, and a little aside here. Have either one of you heard of a gentleman named Fred Astaire? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Years ago, a man's ability to dance, to, to uh, lead someone around the dance floor, was uh, uh, quite an arrow in the quiver of, of especially a young bachelor out seeking companionship. But somehow the ability to dance, which is uh, athletic artistry uh, with, with uh, the ability to follow you know, a musical note, uh, somehow over the years has segued into something that is not masculine, is somehow feminine. And uh, if, if anyone um, ever wants to see uh, something sublimely ridiculous, I'm sure there's a YouTube video of a, uh, of a, a football team trying to do a dance workout. If you ever want to watch one of those, you'll find out who the real athletes That's right. are. But I just I find it fascinating that um, somehow the, the opinion that dance is not a, a masculine activity has uh, come to the forefront, and, and I'm and I'm glad we're involved in maybe changing that mm -hmm. mindset. So go ahead, talk. About so this. so these uh, these um, school districts and the the athletic uh, associations that are tied with these school districts uh, have said that no dancing is really only for girls, mm -hmm. uh, and they have uh, prevented these uh, these very talented young men uh, from being able to compete on the dance teams. Uh, and I think it's a fascinating. These are, these are teams, ladies and gentlemen. These aren't these aren't men competing with the athletic advantage of, of longer uh, lever arms and greater muscle mass. These are members of teams, so they would raise the level of whatever team they are performing. That's right. Is that correct? That's okay. absolutely right. right. Um, and I, I think it's a fascinating case because I think there's a misconception that. Uh, a lot of, uh, we'll say, lay people have about libertarians, mm. and that's that uh, libertarians love discrimination, mm. that we want to be able to, to discriminate all the time and separate people, and uh, we don't want to have to listen to all this uh, civil rights stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that this case is great because it helps bring out that uh, misconception. Uh, this is discrimination being performed, um, you know, inextricably tied up in uh, government functions. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as a matter of, uh, uh, you know, of our, of our uh, new founding principles after the Civil War, uh, and I think there's a very good argument for uh, even, even our principles before that, as a matter of constitutional law, government cannot um, treat, treat uh, similar people 
differently. They, in uh, Title VII, which is not the Constitution, but it's, uh, it's Congress has said, uh, you know, in government-funded uh, athletic programs in schools, um, you can't have this sex discrimination. So when the government comes in and tries to discriminate like this, um, I think it's really bad news. It's bad news for these young men. It's bad news for the teams. It's bad news, frankly, for the progress that we've been making on uh, gender roles in this country. Okay. I think we only have about, and, I, and I, I'm not me trying to, to keep you out of the conversation, hopefully. Not at all. Um, but I want to kind of throw something out that uh, uh, there was a senator, Ben Sass, or Sass, I don't know how you pronounce his name. Um, during the Kavanaugh hearings, there's, there's a gentleman named Kavanaugh uh, who is uh, uh, being, as we speak, roasted over a, a slow fire as he uh, tries to become a, a member of the Supreme Court of the United States. And um, a lot of people are asking, kind of asking a question, but it's not being asked out loud, and I think it's really in a lot of people's mind. Why is the Supreme Court so important? The Supreme Court didn't used to be you, you never saw anything about the Supreme Court in the news. Uh, members of the Supreme Court, people probably didn't even know their names. Um, and now, all of a sudden, uh, one man becoming a Supreme Court justice somehow, uh, in the eyes of many people, um, is going to change the course of United States history. Why did the Supreme Court become so important? What's, what's going on here? Does anybody have a thought on that? Well, I think I know what you're going to suggest, which is why I'd like you to suggest it first before okay. I rebut. Okay. So, um, oh, you're going to rebut. This That's is right. going to be fun. Um, so the, 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 the gentleman's point, uh, actually not my point, the senator's point, was that uh, um, the Supreme Court has become tremendously imp important because uh, the legislature has uh, given up, self-emasculated, given its, uh, its ability to create law to independent regulatory agencies, and given them so much uh, leeway in, in interpreting uh, the guidance from legislatures uh, as they set up regulations, and really becoming judge, jury, and executioner. Somehow the, the Congress has, has given uh, these independent regulatory agencies powers that Congress itself does not have. Congress has, has legislative power, and they've vested these independent regulatory agencies with uh, legislative, uh, judicial, and executive power. And so the Supreme Court is frequently called on to uh, rein in or interpret these things. And I, I think it makes a valid point. Your rebut is? Now, my, my rebuttal is that I think that the Supreme Court uh, also abdicates um, it's, it's responsibility and it's constitutional burden in a lot of mm -hmm. cases. And I think um, together between Congress and the Supreme Court abdicating their roles, that's why you get this monstrous um, administrative regulatory state mm -hmm. because the Supreme Court has doctrine upon doctrine, layers of case law. Um, precedent. To, pre yes. think, yeah, precedent to the effect that um, they've got to defer to the agency's interpretations uh, of congressional statutes. They've got to defer to the agency's interpretation of that same, that very same agency's writings. Uh, and so I think uh, the, the Supreme Court's incredibly important and they could take a little bit more of the judicial power back from, for themselves, mm -hmm. and I think that they should. Uh, but as a matter of, uh, of recent history, I think that the trend has been to sort of say, this looks complicated, we don't want to get too involved, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to defer to the agency mm -hmm. uh, and to the regulators to figure out what all this law means. Mm -hmm. We're not going to uh, insert ourselves here, we're not going to superimpose ourselves. Okay. Um, and that's, that's, by the way, it's the same attitude, I think, that you saw in the New Deal that stripped so many of the, uh, the economic liberty precedents. There used to be something mm -hmm. called the Lochner era, where the Supreme Court said you can't, states and the federal government can't just come in uh, and regulate people's private economic activity. Um, and that era ended essentially when the Supreme Court said, well, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different governing philosophies, and we don't want to superimpose ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I think the Supreme Court needs to stand up and take some more responsibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want, do you have any, anything you want to add to that? Well, uh, and I Randy? definitely think that you're right that they should take more of their 
designed responsibilities, although I do have to agree with you and Senator Sass. I hope I'm getting his name right. That Sassy Sass, I don't know. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Um, that the legislature has... That the legislature has, as you put it a moment ago, emasculated itself. They aren't doing... That was Sass that said that. No. I just stole his line. Okay. Go ahead, yeah for lack of a better term, they've emasculated themselves. They've ceded responsibilities that they should have as an elected body that's supposed to be the voice of the people for the federal government to either the judicial or the executive framework. As far as the judicial framework goes, you're seeing precedent, or, well, the entire line of questioning. I know that the Democrats have picked up on, well, what's your decision on Roe v. Wade? Mm -hmm. They're kicking the can over to the judicial mm. rather than taking responsibility for it and actually drafting legislation because they're, in my opinion, worried about the effect that that could have on their re-election campaign. elected. Oh, and on I that know. note, uh, this isn't... Versus a, someone who has a life term yeah. taking responsibility this, for it. This isn't... I didn't mean to interrupt, Randy. Sorry, but I want to I close on this idea if I can. Uh, folks, if you look up two Supreme Court precedents, uh, there's something called Chevron deference. And there's something else called our deference. And our is not our wonderful country, O-U-R. It's uh, A-U-E-R. That's right, yeah. And, and these are um, Supreme Court decisions. And again, we, we talk about the, 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 the power of the Supreme Court. Maybe that's why they call them the Supremes. Uh, they, they formally abdicated power a number of years ago in these two cases and gave these independent regulatory agencies, which... The organization I worked for thinks are actually the whole idea of an independent regulatory agency is, in its, by its very nature, unconstitutional. Yeah, Our founding yeah. fathers would, quite frankly, roll in their graves over it. Um, check check them out and now. see if you don't think it's about time that they overturn them. The good news is that many of, some of, the uh, Supreme Court justices in speeches and in mutterings and in writings and some dissenting opinions mm -hmm have said that that era maybe should end. And on that note, I think uh, we're getting ready to wind down the show. Uh, Dave Dearson, legal fellow at Pacific Legal Foundation, I want to thank you very much for your uh, putting up with my disorganization this evening and being quite, quite charming and informative. Brandon, even more so, because uh, at least uh, David and I had a chance to chat before the show, whereas I think you got one email from me and we never talked. You did a marvelous a job. Thank you for having I, me. I think you have a, a great future uh, as an anarchical uh, politician, if that's possible. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for the, the many thousands of you who are watching the show tonight. Uh, rapt attention. You're not even blinking from what I can see. Yes, we can see you. And I hope that uh, you, if you missed anything on the show, you will uh, check us out on YouTube or on uh, Access Sacramento where the shows are, are replayed uh, three times live at 8 o'clock on uh, Thursday on Channel 17 in the Sacramento area. And then uh, at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning on Saturday and I, I think noon on Friday. I think those are the three times Lee is nodding in the background. Uh, I think we're right. Yeah. Channel 17 locally. And on that note, uh, I wish you um, uh, freedom first and, and peace if possible, but certainly freedom first. Thank you again for watching Libertarian Counterpoint, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.